will be followed by Joy James and Sela Howitz um, uh, Terrible. So over to you, Jane. Okay. Okay, so the name of this talk, I've given it a little name. It's called Telling a Fiction that an Acts of Silence that's Always Speaking. Okay. And I'll just say something about the, about the title. Um, the reason I take myself to be telling a fiction right now is for two reasons. One, when you're telling things from memory, you, 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 fiction to me does not mean falsehood. Okay, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean falsity. falsity. Um, I'm telling a fiction, I'm telling things from memory. But I also think I'm telling a fiction because in today's time, people put everything online. They record things, they put them online. I see people crying out for safe spaces and living their lives out loud online. I'm talking about black girls and black women, and I can't just speak, have their lives out loud online in that way. So I am telling a fiction that an acts of silence so Let me just wait for two seconds so people can get settled. Okay. When the lights are on, the students don't have fun. They don't dance. They just walk around so the lights are off. Sometimes the students wear wristbands that glow in the dark. In the past, they cost $5. Some of the black students couldn't afford them. The lights are turned off. The teachers have flashlights, and they use them mostly on black girls, who gather in the middle of the room while most of the white kids hang around the edges. The teachers use big flashlights to check the black girls out, to check out their sexual conduct. I feel like I'm a security threat. I can't be myself. I feel like they can't trust any of the black girls if they have flashlights shining on us. It feels like being locked into one place. It feels like I'm in a cage, a cage where you can talk and dance. But this happens only with black girls. Most white girls run around, even chasing boys. It feels like something is wrong with our type. What I just read may sound like a poem. Maybe it is. I think it's fair to say, however, that in the context in which a 12-year-old black girl living in the United States her mother from the Caribbean, her father from a Northwest African country. She did not intend to study. That's just the way she spoke. I was a stranger, an outsider, coming to listen to the stories of black girls in schools and other places, such as juvenile halls. In fact, I spoke with one girl who was facing life in prison. They were waiting her for her to go from age 14 to 16 so that they could try her as an adult and get her for life. I was looking for black girls who might want to speak at a town hall on behalf of themselves and other black girls and women. In The Mute Always Speaks, on Women's Silence is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Professor Matsimi, and I might do your name such damage, please. Uh, okay. uh, she demonstrated that, quote, when we reject dominant Western oppositional hierarchies of silence and speech, and instead adopt frameworks where words, silence, dreams, gestures, tears, <laughs> all exist interdependently in the same interpretive field, we find that the mute always speak. Professor Mutsumi observed that women's recollections are often about the context of daily life, quote, home domesticity relationships, and quotidian lives are employed to map out their experiences of human rights violations. My desire is to bring Professor Matsumi's observations to bear on the experience of black girls in the U.S. context, with whom I interacted in the context of identifying black girls to tell their stories in a town hall for black girls and women. I used different methods to create a path towards the girls. At times, I read to them voices of other black girls, written into Monique Morris's push out, the criminalization of black girls in the schools. Monique Morris has written extensively about the fact that black girls in the United States experience the highest levels of school suspension. They bear the most at risk for domestic violence and sex trafficking and are the most likely to die violently. Speaking of her lived experiences and works with one black girl recorded and transcribed by Morris said, quote, I think the reason that they do that is the boys, dot, 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 Sometimes the boys can be more attracted to black girls, especially when it comes to body shape. Okay. And they think it's going to distract the boys, so they do tell the black girls to cover up. Because that's who the boys are looking at. 
Shemitah said. They're looking at black girls. They're looking at the white girls too, but they're looking at their faces. They're not finna really covered. I don't know what finna means. I forgot because the girls told me. I don't know what finna means. Okay. They're not finna really cover up the white girls. It's notable that Shamika felt, this is Maurice Moore, um, Monique Moore's <coughs> It's notable that Shamika felt boys were attracted to white girls' faces, but to black girls' bodies. And that she didn't pause or skip a beat in explaining as much. Quote, this is Monique Morris asking the girl, so if they're not looking at your face, what do you think they're looking at? I asked Shamika. They're looking at your butt or your boobs. I could have read this girl's words to the girl who conjectured that something must be wrong with her type. As it happens, I hadn't. Sometimes all a girl had to see was that I was all hers. That's what happened with the girl who creatively spoke when the lights were on. I hadn't even introduced her to the concept of school push-out, but her teacher, young black woman, had introduced her to notions of intersectionality, and I introduced her and a friend of hers to Crenshaw's intersectional GM case. And then I asked them to play lawyer. I wanted one to represent the black women, and I wanted the other to represent the, co the company. The other little girl who left before the speaking of when the lights go out took place, she didn't want to represent the company. She figured the company would lose and would have to pay a great deal of damages to the black women. But she played along and became a real lawyer, asking, you mean to tell me that GM didn't hire black women to work in the cafeteria to clean the toilets? I don't believe it. Well, it was hard to believe. A brilliant observation just might change the meaning of the GM case, as it is given in the literature, where the idea was that black women were not hired, period. The little girl's challenge implied that black women's GM case must have been about getting those, those jobs reserved for white women. And that's not, not getting hired at all. I'd like to add that for the, anyone who thinks that black women in our communities do not theorize their own lives and need academics to do that for them, I hear such words more often than not. I've heard them in this conference. Then they have only to remember that black women have been theorizing their lives since grade school and probably before when they were babies and learned how to say, uh-uh, where's the If we suppose for a moment that I was the girl's first adult listener. Now I'm back to the girl who spoke the poem when the lights were on. Then we must ask why. How did this happen? <coughs> we might also ask, what made the frame for speaking possible in that moment? Was it because I was perceived to be a, a black woman captive audience? We might also ask, had speaking that which had caused her pain, because it clearly had pain and shame, in the manner in which she spoke it, had it been unspeakable before a moment to an adult or perhaps to anyone? If so, and even if not so, where in that young girl's body had she been carrying around the feeling of being <coughs> huge? Where did the tightness pinch and press up against her? How did the pain express itself in her daily life? How might it express itself in the future? Will she become once, one amongst a growing number of African American women across class who lose their fetuses on one day due, it's been hypothesized, to racist <coughs> microaggressions they experience on a daily basis and their body's constant fight or flight responses? We can only try to imagine the range of, quote from Dr. Monsignor, languages of pain and grief the girl used at home, at school, at church to narrate the hidden shaming elements of her school life, her body speaking to silences that she did not speak. As I said, I used different methods to go where the girls were and bring them to me, different methods in, in different schools with different girls. I wasn't methodical. This wasn't an experiment. The girls weren't subjects. I even cooked for some of them, and I don't cook. <laughs> Whether or not the girls spoke with each other of certain things, it became clear that they did not speak with their trusted and beloved counselors about those things. And there were trusted and beloved counselors, black women who cared for them. Evidence that such was the case came from what happened when I played a group of girls, Kimberly Crenshaw's Breaking the Silence, in order to give them an idea of what a town hall for black girls and women could be like. Crenshaw was addressing a group of primarily black girls and women in a real town hall setting. This is what she said. This hearing began with the common sense conversation that we're having with the communities of color. 
The common sense conversation that says men and boys are the primary object of racism. Women and girls are doing okay. Women and girls don't need any particular intervention. End of quote. Crenshaw went on to ask, what could we do to make sure that girls and women did not have to wait to receive the attention deserved? Quote, we don't wait. We don't wait to get an invitation to tell our stories. We can create spaces to tell our stories, end of quote. In fact, we don't, indeed we don't. We don't wait to get an invitation to tell our stories. We can create space, we, um, in fact, we don't or shouldn't wait or look for large organizations, even such as Crenshaw's, African American Policy Forum, to speak to our own girls in our own, <coughs> our own communities. As discussed at lunch yesterday with Professor Matsumi, we can speak to our own girls in our own communities, although this may pose challenges. And we can do so without the problem <coughs> their voices hijacked by the agendas of large quasi-corporate organizations whose continued existence may depend on instrumentalizing the girls to some degree or other. In any case, in the Breaking the Silence clip, black girls, one after the other, told their stories to Crenshaw and other black women who were seen listening actively, concerned, painting their faces. My girls broke down right in the middle. One left the room, the others cried. Those who cried less held those who cried more. One whom I held in that moment told me through tears and sniffling that she wanted to tell her story to help other black girls. And that's what she did at a town hall. And it was a very painful experience for her. That's another story, that's her story. Again, I want us to keep in mind that, at least with respect to their school environment, the girls have been mute, but speaking all the while before this moment. That is what Dr. McSimmy helps us understand. How have they been speaking the pain they now cried? How are they being punished for the expression of that pain, which most likely went unheard? A counselor, one who did what Professor McSimmy described in the keynote experience, accounted, unaccounted work of creating and helping to stitch together the children's everyday lives, she told me that the girl who had left the room had, by, had been triggered by something in the film something that had urged her to tell the counselor something she had never told anyone before. With that one telling, the school administrators were urged to find a therapist. They found the state funds to pay for it. This all happened immediately. Before she spoke, perhaps the girl was thought to be simply difficult, someone who required punishment of some kind, which I got the sense that these schools usually involved being isolated. My guess is that that girl had already been punished to the core of her being, having committed no transgression that the count could account for, and she knew it. And the town hall gave her evidence for it. I was told that the material I showed the girls week after week, black girls talking about their lives, because that's what the material was, not just town halls, all kinds of stuff I would get black girls, poor black girls. In fact, poor dark black girls usually, mm -hmm. speaking about their lives. And I was told it was too hard on the girls. I'm not a therapist. Maybe it was too hard. Maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. Um, and to go back, I, I, I admit when I started, and I didn't even do that, I should have thanked um, Dr. Spencer and Dr. Khan. And I also wanted in the very beginning to say my thanks to Sipakazi. And I want to say about Sipakazi that, as I've told her, she brings everyone along with her. And by that, I don't mean just younger people, intergenerationally, she'll bring someone around along like me who could be her mother. Okay, she brings you along. But what I wanted to say to get to this part here, I am hard. So it's, it, it's not surprising that I introduce hard frames and simple cause it reminds me to be gentle because she is gentle in all her strength and brilliance. So I must as I told, I, so speaking of Steve Puppy's gentleness, gentleness, I have to remember it and try to embody it because I am hard. But you know what? Those hard frames, and back to my hardness, <laughs> seem to have something to do with transforming experiences the girls would not tell the adults at school. Adults who, could, who, who were able to help them in some instances. Um, and so they told me. Some of the girls even wanted me to record them telling their stories. They were a little shy about it. They liked watching themselves their stories being told by them in pocket documentaries. I co-created with them. One girl told a story about abuse in her family. The girl loved her father. She said so without flinching. But the violence, the beating had to stop. She also said so without flinching. The girls forgot about 
testifying and telling stories. We played and their lives just kept pouring out of their dreams. Most of them had guardian angels in their dreams. And their passions, for instance, for fighting. Some of them loved the theme of fighting. They explained, if they fought another girl and won, they wanted to finish her off. If you got in the way of their ending, you would end up on the floor. They didn't care whether you were a teacher or an SRO. They didn't care who you were. They were sorry, but that's where you would end up. As they would fight, they would grab their weight back to get their <coughs> adversary and put the right finishing touches on the battle, as they understood it. The violent sentiment of passion was something that seemed to be unspeakable to the adults in the school. The counselor had never heard of them boasting of fighting. In the tales they told, according to the counselors, the girls were never the instigators in their own fights. That's what I was told by the counselors. But when they told me stories, they were the instigators. They became the heroines of their own stories, not the victims. Um, the ethics of the school be damned. And some also told me that they were ready to fight when they came to school. What, after having to get their little sisters ready for school, take care of a baby, make sure that everyone had, been, had eaten? One girl who had to be a mother every day before she left for school said, by the time I get to school, I'm ready to fight. I need someone to check in with me at the door before the day begins. But there are no resources for that. What are the conditions under which the apparently unspeakable becomes speakable? And a relief or even a joy to speak? What are the conditions institutions um, do so that our children can talk, even talk back, but don't allow them to speak their minds about what they take to be true? I suspect, but I'm not sure, that although I was an adult in the school, I was not understood to be one of the real authorities by the girls. Perhaps I laugh in places where teachers and counselors don't laugh. Perhaps the difference was that I did show them things and talk about things, those two hard things, that teachers and counselors wouldn't show them. On the other hand, I wasn't one of the girls. I never pretended that I was framing, I wasn't framing a narrative. They knew that I was conducting some kind of intervention, but they were game. Although, <coughs> they accepted the setups, but figured out quickly that with me they could change it up and give me something I didn't ask for. Is that part of what made unspeakability speakable, the possibility of improvising for themselves a new piece of the game? Didn't Professor Matsumi <coughs> tell us that creating was about survival? And is it creating the expression of desire? Were they not asking to be considered in whatever game I was setting into motion? One day, I videotaped them telling stories. One girl, a leader, told the story about stopping a fight between a white dude and a black dude. 14 years old, she and the black boy who had been got fighting got thrown into the back of a police squad. She said, this time they put the handcuffs on real tight. I thought, this time? How many times have you been thrown into the back of a police squad? But I didn't speak. She was taken to a center of incarceration for juveniles and lived there for five days. She stayed there matter of fact, because perhaps that's what it was, a now matter of fact in her life. Believe me, I wanted to know more, but I remained silent, which is a good thing. Because she took the conversation where I couldn't have taken it. And it doesn't matter how many times I'd read her shout. The girl said, this is not what we need to be talking about. We need to be talking about what's going on right here in this school. She wanted the daily life thing that Dr. McSinney talks about. She wanted to talk about her daily life, which for the moment wasn't incarceration. It was school. She began a conversation, led a conversation, got almost every girl involved. She was able to do that probably because she was a leader, but also because what she spoke affected almost every girl present. School uniforms. That's what they wanted to talk about. Their bodies. They got policed. Who got to go against the rules and where they wanted without punishment? Who didn't get to? They didn't get to. Black girls. That's who. The leader wanted us to all talk to the principal, but she had to go to class. So I went with another group of girls without her. We went off to find the principal. Really, we were quite merry. Not quite merry little group. We weren't, you know. But instead, we found the lovely, beautiful black women who stitched their lives together with love and care, Monday through Friday. With confidence, we all spoke the problem. Now here's what sometimes happens when words previously unspoken, which do not constitute silence, are suddenly are spoken. The counselor spoke to me. She spoke to all of us, but she spoke to me like I was a reasonable woman. She should have spoken to the girls before. She would have known that I wasn't that reasonable. She spoke to me like I was a reasonable woman. Couldn't I see that some of the girls in uniform wearing leggings was just fine, but that other girls out of uniform and wearing leggings was indecent? 
Couldn't I see that? He was opposite, a threat? Something wrong with their type? Oh, I could see it all right because I had had one of those indecent bodies. But as I recall, the threat was always to me and not the other way around. So now we are talking. <coughs> but, so that's what I said with an edge in my voice. But turns out that was her story too. That's what she said when the tears came. Okay, so now she's crying because we're talking about all our bodies. But even though, or perhaps with tears, she had told me, and the girl standing next to me also talking, wearing tight pants they made her wear because she was out of uniform. She's crying, but she's still saying, the rule is not going to change. The rule is not going to change. The woman said those words, speaking someone else's words. The girl spoke, I can't even breathe in these pants you've made me wear. Indeed, she had to remove them. They were cutting off her circulation. Mm -hmm. All for the sake of someone's idea of decency, a black girl couldn't believe, breathe in a community where black people in the States now repeat like a mantra, breathe, breathe, and say mm -hmm. things such as, breathing is revolutionary. It's a revolutionary act. The girl I called leader had a guardian angel who had died in her arms. That's the girl who couldn't come with us. He often returned to her, telling her to breathe. But this girl wasn't allowed to breathe, could barely walk in the pants she was forced to wear because she was out of uniform and indecent and a threat. There were other poor, poor pants she could put on, we were told now a man, an administrator, had joined us. He was yeah, there were other pants. They're boys' pants, the girl said. How would you feel if you had to wear man's pants? She said to the woman, who did love them. Mm -hmm. Indeed, how does a black girl forced to wear boys' clothes feel in the context in which black girls and women are masculinized and hyper -feminized? How does a dark-skinned black girl, as this girl was, feel in a country where dark-skinned black girls, according to the research of Atiba Goff, are misidentified by white people as being boys or men and are thought in many black communities not to possess the seductions of femininity? Mm -hmm. The girl walked out. That loving woman followed her, calling out behind her. The girl had said her last words. Now she might have gone deaf. She walked, she didn't stop, wouldn't stop, wouldn't speak. I was left with another girl. I don't have enough time to tell her story in this because she interviewed as well. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. Um, and that was the one who wanted to record her experience of family abuse, which I did. I love my father to pieces, the girl said, but the violence had to stop. That's how she ended her speech. I was asked not to return. But it turns out that they didn't even one last time. I returned with roses for each girl, and Rita Franklin and Rose is still a rose, and a history mm -hmm. lesson. A white woman surveilled us, which had never happened before. They put a white woman in a room with me to be with these black girls? What had they imagined? That some white woman was going to tie my tongue with her policing eyes? When I finished giving a history lesson on white supremacy and how it masculinized and criminalized black girls, well, she was the only one deflecting her eyes, stewing in her own silence. I looked at her, daring her to speak. She could have. She didn't want to. I told the girls that I was going to come back. They hadn't known. One said, oh, I know why. No elaboration necessary. Could the girl have elaborated? What would she have elaborated? And I'll have to end there, but maybe at some point, because I really wanted to end, but I guess I don't have the time. I wanted to show, can I show quickly? It's, it's, it's really quick, it's, it, and I won't read from this, because when you read, it gets, um, oh, it's not that, it's this one. Okay. This is art by Professor Adrian Piper, a black woman, African-American woman, born in, in, in Harlem, Sugar Hill section. Uh, she left the white racist academy of the United States, Wellesley, left because it was racist, went to Berlin to start her own foundation. And she had the largest retrospective of any artist ever in New York City this summer. She wasn't at her own retrospective. That speaks volumes to me. In any case, what if I, after, in the context of what we're talking about, of what's happening, I had shown the girls this, what, what we have talked about. So let's see. talk 
talked about looking at that. I need the light on because I can't see. I need to go back to um, my frame. I'm sorry. Thank you for turning it off. But I need to push escape and then we can turn it back on. And what might we... I love frames to get people to speak with him. I would have used these as frames had I come back. Um, so let me see if this one... This one's called a night. What might we have said about being a switch? What partial truths might we have spoken? So why we speak in the situation in which a black woman who genuinely cares for a black girls must shoot them down in the name of blank? What words do we speak here in the blank? Indeed, what might we say about an institution in looking at Unite, headed by a black man who has made it clear that the rules are not going to change, spoken through the mouth of a black woman, because blank? What words dare we not utter? because we are mute and only speak. detriment of the black intramural or interracial in general 
and black revolutionary politics in particular. <clears throat> the ability to mete out violence against black women, black children, black queer and gender non-conforming folk is violence sanctioned by institutionally granted access to the tools of humanity and hegemony, what serves anti-black interests and not any black individual person. For access to these tools in the first instance is contingently granted only if it serves anti-black interests and in the second instance never bolsters any mode of blackness into power. These tools are wielded to mete out punishment to blackness that can never and must never be incorporated into hegemonic conceptions of what it means to be human or free and what serves the interests of white power. So black social life lived underground in Jared Sexton's phrasing, however, includes modes of psychic resistance we have yet to fully understand. And this resistance also includes violence, not just as a means of, for self-defense, but violence in and as the space of revolution, as a condition of possibility for black love. This very resistance is inexorably linked to black women and other groups of black people with less access to the instruments of borrowed institutionality. Their suffering made legible and illegible within revolutionary movements. And I preface this within my analysis of Winnie Mandela's forced speech and silences prior to and during the Truth and Reconciliation hearings in the 90s. It was not only the South African government that was able to deploy and manipulate the trope of pathological violence in motherhood, but also the ANC. When Madikizela Mandela's militancy and leadership threatened the conciliatory politics of the ANC, which they adopted after Mandela's negotiations with the clerk, its leadership was catapulted into one mode of crisis. The ANC was aided by the conclusions of the TRC as many black South Africans were disenfranchised by Mandela's willingness to drop the demand for economic nationalization. They needed to demonize any public figure tied to their sanctioning of revolutionary violence in an effort to sanitize their image for white and other non-black South Africans. Mandela manipulated the same strategies to elicit public, i.e global white support for the new administration under his charge, taking steps to ensure that future administration's politics would reflect the same neoliberal counter-revolutionary stance. During speech, a speech for the township of Munsiville on April 13, 1986, Winnie Madikizela Mandela uttered the following statement, which would be circulated in the interest of the South African government's media propaganda war machine. Together, hand in hand, with our boxes of matches and our necklaces, we shall liberate the country. The discourse of necklacing as it circulated in the media could be no further divorced from the discourse and practice of necklacing within townships. The practice of planting informants within any ranks of revolutionary organizing was one of the most pernicious of the government's practices. By planting black informants within black organizations to kill black South Africans, the government was able to circulate propaganda about black-on-black -black violence within the townships as justification for heightened state intervention through militarization, curfews, and detentions. Government implementation of STRATCOM included infiltration of and psychological warfare against revolutionary guerrilla movements, and the necklace method was employed by both the states via the secret police and infiltrators against black South Africans and by black South Africans as an instrument of self-defense against the state. Due to the tactics of psychological warfare, such as the fomenting of suspicion by infiltrating radical organizations, wiretapping phones, murder of insurgents, torture of detainees, the white regime fueled distrust in already tenuous communities of anti-apartheid struggle. Through STRATCOM, the government deployed the press to publicly denounce the ANC as a violent mob who posed more danger to politically moderate black South Africans than the state. Madikizela Mandela's statement regarding necklacing was circulated internationally, and since she had been banned, she was prohibited from responding publicly to her speech, which was taken out of its intramural context. Her words and her silencing was weaponized immediately by the state as part of its counter-revolutionary counter warfare efforts to undermine revolutionary organizations, convert increasing global sentiment against apartheid to the side of the state, and most importantly, depoliticize the violence of black insurgents. <coughs> 
administration proliferated the rhetoric of black-on-black -black violence, attributing it to revolutionary organizations such as the ANC and its, quote, communist allies. And by infiltrating the liberation movement, murdering <coughs> activists, and sowing suspicion within organizations, the apartheid government perpetuated a form of warfare to ice insurgency within various ranks of organizations, portraying black people within South Africa in the media as complicit, if not responsible, for the violence they suffered. Winnie suffered a different form of press scrutiny than her progenitors. Beginning in the 1970s, when the media linked her presence to the 1976 Soweto uprising, scapegoating her for inciting youth activists to riot. Indeed, her position as both former wife of jailed celebrity insurgent turned president and, quote, mother of the nation, placed her in a more precarious position. Even after her death, she remains a popular recipient of misogynistic ire, often portrayed as, quote, an unrepentant black woman, a witch, and even compared to Lady Macbeth, quote, vaulting ambition, a capacity for ruthless conspiracy, abuse of devotion, the smell of blood that will not leave her hands, the persistent ghosts. As her popularity increased in terms of mobilizing black people across the globe, state and press attacks on her image increased as well. The continuing banning orders she received were to erase her presence from both the world stage and from youth activists within South Africa. But as the government's counterinsurgency plans were met with increasing militancy from black South Africans, Winnie's image transformed in the press and eventually within the ANC. Newspaper headlines such as, More Corpses in Winnie's Cover, Whatever Went Wrong with Winnie, and Mandela's Biggest Challenge, His Estranged Wife, appeared in global publications. Even the US magazine Vanity Fair published an article titled, How Bad is Winnie Mandela? <laughs> Penned by Stratcom operative Paul Rasmus. Anji Krogh, a white South African poet and academic, in writing about Madizela Mandela's presence at the TRC hearings, described the media frenzy surrounding her as follows. Why is it that a black a woman, a black woman from a long, isolated country, creates such an unprecedented media frenzy? Is it because Winnie Madizela Mandela answers to the archetype black and beautiful, or because she answers to the stereotype black and evil? Legally sanctioned for being a bad mother, mothers to MK fighting, fighters living in her home, the youth of Mandela Football League, and to youth killed by informants placed in her cohort, the tropes of pathological violence, irredeemable lasciviousness, maternal neglect, and corruption of black youth that erupted in the US antebellum and Jim Crow South converged with the pathologization of black womanhood in apartheid South Africa. The state's fears of black insurgency were played out on characterizations of Winnie's body, <coughs> with whom she was associating, how she was dressed in those khakis they used to critique her about, and how she handled the bodies of youth in her charge. Indeed, the media and government created a monstrous mystique about Winnie, portraying her at times, even in the TRC hearings, as invincible, if not impervious to pain. But what remains, what remains most striking is, Winnie, is Winnie's insights documented in her prison diaries during the earlier years of her involvement in liberation struggle, where she refers to herself and her comrades as follows. I did not know what my fate would be because we were part of an experiment. We were the foot soldiers. We were their cannon fodder, and it was us who were used as their political barometer each time they wanted to find out how the country was going to react. They tortured us knowing that it was going to leak to the country and they wanted to test the reaction. Here we see the machinations of a psyche under the most brutal conditions of psychological warfare. The government utilizing the suffering of comrades as weapons to neutralize and break revolutionaries. It is beyond media propaganda, the issue of representation or political tactics that determine the ease with which when he continues to be demonized. Precisely due to her position as a black woman in the movement who explicitly discussed, if not condoned, violence as a strategy, not tactic. The tropes deployed against her were saturated with a violent history and meaning that continued to distort our movements for black liberation. While the TRC did conclude that Jerry Richardson, a police informant, was responsible along with the police for the murder of Stompy Sepai and two MK cadres, it also found the following. 
Mandela was negligent in that she failed to institute inquiries into the deaths of the two cadres at the time and that her misplaced trust in Jerry Richardson was the direct cause of their deaths. The uneven power relations between the apartheid government and the revolutionary movement were erased within a discourse that implicitly relied on criminalizing black descent. Moreover, this criminalization was a facile enterprise when aided by the utilization of the rhetoric of black maternal pathology. Crow once again describes her experience at the hearings thusly. I extricate myself from the web of cables and go outside for air. On the pavement, a man is selling little white plates with faces on them. Nelson Mandela, Tabo Mbeki, Joe Slovo, and Winnie Mandela, all in the same row. I flinch from the ardent sun and turn back. Where to? I cannot live in a space where the face of Nelson Mandela is interchangeable with that of Winnie Medicazella Mandela. Villainized and depicted as an object of disgust, Winnie's image was placed in stark contrast to the affable of Mandela. Doubly penalized by the DRC, first for bad mothering, endangering children such as Sepai, and secondly for her affect, trusting the wrong people. The seamless transition between the hearings, performative empathy for Sepe's mother, the criminalization of Winnie, and punishment of Richardson, who worked in the interests of the apartheid state, illuminates the extent to which conceptions of black women's abjection and black men's debasement serve to feed white jouissance and excess of joy. The hearings continue the status quo, making violence against black people both palatable and justifiable with her reputation continuously tarnished by her peers and the press. Mandela utilized this as an opportunity to fire her in 1995 from her post as a deputy cabinet minister, solidifying his attempts to steer Mbeki into position as his successor. My formulation of a violence, a theory of violence here that utilizes the black woman as a barometer in Winnie's words for the violence of the psycho-political condition of modernity is distinct from theories of violence of racialization writ large. Our psyche's constitution and violence leaves a material trace in 20th and 21st century politics that we can read, map, and follow through both revolutionary, black revolutionary movements and the sphere of black intimacy. I argue these conceptions of violence are incumbent on an implicit acquiescence of the mythology of black brutality and how this tacit consent affects the black intramural. I'm referring to the production and the meaning of blackness and violence, black violence and anti-black violence, as more than the production and circulation of signifiers or representation. The violence of discourse continues to police the insurgent dreams and rage of black people suffering across the globe. Each act of political praxis, all filial affect, and every attempt at community registers as performative, abstracted from the conditions of absence and negation, interpreted as exemplars of pathology. Winnie's statements regarding violence in general and necklacing in particular affirm a poesis and performance of revolutionary desire by re-articulating the violence of the state back to the state. What many of the townships continue to display is a reverence toward a figure who demonstrated a form of black love that was tethered to responsibility, the responsibility to a movement defined by blackness in its fullest range. Blackness tethered to the violence of its conceit as much to violence as a mode of resistance. After Winnie's speech about necklacing, the concerted effort to link her in the media with an apolitical mob violence allowed the state in 86 to declare emergency rule. The discourse over necklacing obscured the state's fear of rising insurgency in the townships, inverted power relations, and representations of violence in the media, justifying military occupation of at least 97 townships. The portrait of blackness and the use there, and the black intramural by extension, and the use of the dissemination of them as always already violent, violence in waiting, and or essentialized violence, was made possible vis-a-vis -vis the political and epistemic exploitation of the conceptual link between violence and blackness. By situating images of necklacing as a form of black on black crime, the state quelled white conscious and unconscious anxiety about their own racial animus, white enjoyment and their disavowal of the extremity of white violence. And it's against this libidinal economy of white jouissance that black resistance 
black love in the face of unrelenting violence gets mobilized as pathological communal violence. The necklace method, method as one form of justice occurred in the space and time of what Sadia Hartman describes as the black ordinary in extreme circumstances, the quotidian violence of torture, murder, and captivity during apartheid. Only through analyzing a psyche evacuated in and through violence can one understand an often ignored, overlooked, and disavowed truth of violence and its relationship to anti-blackness. By understanding the impossibility of delinking violence from the construction of blackness, violence from the condition of blackness, and violence from black desire, ranging from how and by whom black affect is read to how black love is registered, we can shift our focus from behavior modification which further sutures black suffering as pathological rather than politically induced to a structural analysis of power. Hence, it is incumbent upon us to create modes of theorizing and forms of political praxis that would enable us to think of a black collectivity that may foreclose the ways in which love, gender, and black revolutionary figures have been packaged for our consumption. Perhaps black love in the space of violence as the remnants of the violence within which we have been thrown, looks like none other than the unapologetic dissent when he had uttered for us long ago when she claimed, quote, I am not prepared to apologize for anything we did whilst we were fighting. I will continue being the white man's enemy for as long as I am alive. And I wonder if we will ever be willing and ready to do the same. For until then, perhaps love cannot and will not matter. half past one and now I wish to suggest that we leave at least 15 minutes for discussion so that we can go to lunch at quarter to two. Um, the next session is at half past two. So I think 45 minutes for, for lunch is fine. Um, over to you. Um, okay. So, good uh, evening, yeah. Um, there's a brief amount of time left so I'm going to condense this. And also there's a clip that I wanted to a show on Erica Gardner. Uh, but first I want to thank the conveners of this gathering, uh, the presenters, and Afi and Lynn, as well as Selimawit for the last couple of days of interrogation and challenging and caretaking that is going to allow us to do the things we're trying to talk about here. So do you want to show the clip first? And I'm going to set it up. Okay, so Erica Gardner passed in December 2017. And I made a commitment from December 2017 to December 2018 to spend a year in tribute to her, to speak about Erica Gardner everywhere that I traveled and every time that I talked in a classroom or spoke in a classroom. So this thing about the mute, I believe, is, is about the ability to articulate oneself, whatever one's level is, as child, as political leader, as elder, and as ancestor. But I also think the question about the mute, when the mute speaks, is whether or not we can actually interpret or translate what is being articulated. And often I think this is what Sally has presented in what Janine said about schools. Okay, this is like a nice setting. Like this. <laughs> it's the way in which our very knowledge is filtered through the discourse of marketing that changes the nature of speaking itself and also what it means to be mute. So that the forms of silencing that we encounter are always resisted, but the ways in which they're resisted feel like they're manifesting as an art form. And Lynn and I, we spoke about mutating love, which is so much of what you ended on, um, and to pick that up. So quickly, Erica Garner did this advertisement for Bernie Sanders, who in 2016 primaried or challenged Hillary Clinton in the um, Democratic primaries. Of course, you know we lost that uh, Donald Trump is now the 45th president of the United States. Clinton was the chosen successor by Obama for the Obama administration, right? Sanders was the disruptor. She, Sanders did not reach out to her as a sitting senator from Vermont. She is an impoverished black woman living in New York City, reached out to him. She conceived this ad, she conceptualized it, she engineered it, she brought it to him, and it was shot. 
Harvey Weinstein is a Hollywood mogul who is now wanted for rape charges, but before then controlled large parts of Hollywood. Once this ad was released, he contacted the Clinton campaign and offered to do an ad to counter Erica Gardner, who is pretty much not formally educated, as I said, impoverished, and whose father had been murdered by the NYPD. I want to show this as a clip that from the other side, she still speaks, and then go quickly into a brief analysis. This is everything that I have for my family. Family should be important to everyone. Mostly I like being a mother, Alyssa. She's six years old. That's my baby, my only child. She likes to read me books, sit down and talk with me about her school. Recently, she just learned about Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. She asked me, did Rosa Parks not give up her seat for a white man? And I said, yes. She said, but those have been that old days, right, Mommy? And I had to explain to her that it's not really over. This is what Mommy is. I'm an activist. And the same thing Martin Luther King was. He fought for our rights. This is the same thing I'm doing in honor of her papa. My dad's name is Eric Garner. No one gets to see their parents' last moments, and I was able to see my dad die on national TV. They don't know what they took from us. He wasn't just someone that no one cared for him or no one loved him. He was loved dearly. Alyssa misses my dad. She tells me, are you okay, Mom? Do you miss Papa? She was, she was here. So her mom wouldn't be sad anymore. I'm just trying to get the truth out there to tell his side of the story. He was being the loving, caring man that he was, and he was murdered. Every Tuesday. For a whole year, I've protested in every Tuesday and Thursday. I feel like a representative for people throughout this whole nation because I'm doing this, I'm, I'm speaking out, me being his daughter. And that's what I want to do, I just want to tell my truth. I'm never giving up, I'm never going to forget, and I don't want the world to forget what happened to my dad. Our people died for this. Martin Luther King died for this. Malcolm X died for this. And who were they? They was protesters. I'm behind anyone who's going to listen and speak up for us. And I think we need to believe in only the light Bernie Sanders. It is not acceptable to me that we have seen young black men walk down streets in this country, be beaten and be killed unjustly. There's no other person that's speaking about this. People are dying. This is real, this is not TV. We need a president that's going to talk about it. The African American community knows that on any given day, some innocent person like Sandra Bland can get into a car, and then three days later she could end up dead in jail. I believe Bernie Sanders is a protester. When a police officer breaks the law, that officer must be held accountable. He's not scared to go up against the criminal justice system. He's not scared. I want to see an America where when young black men walk down the street, they will not be harassed by police officers. They will not be killed. They will not be shot. And that's why I'm from Bernie. this later in terms of the the focus on black men being killed by police, their vulnerability from structural violence, state violence, social violence. We live in a world today the need where there are several hundred million people. Women in, thank you. Um, the importance of women and children uh, manifesting, not just as victims, but also as, as political agents, as having political agency. So, I'm going to argue basically three key things. One, I'm going to 
and entertain the concept of the captive maternal, which we've been debating for the last couple of days. It's an ungendered feminine. I'm aware that patriarchy exists, you know, that heterosexism is normative, but I'm interested in function, not identity. So this is not identity politics, it's not part of intersectionality. I appreciate the appearance of intersectionality as a category or for analysis, but it does not include ideology. And I think in the absence of ideology, there's a lot of confusion um, moving from victimization to agentic agency. The, the capacity to have political thought and demand political changes and to engineer a reality that would reflect the capacity of the love that was spoken about earlier. So I want to add to the important analysis presented um, in the issues raised by on semi, uh, the Mir always speaks, a couple other uh, things for our consideration. One, by discussing the powers that women have to change violent realities, of they, although they incur penalties for doing so, and I think that was um, aptly described in both presentations. Two, by arguing that the loss of innocence for children, which she speaks about in her article, in a violent world is shaped in part by the sacrifices and losses of their captive maternals who themselves can be silenced by more powerful or sovereign captive maternals. So I want to talk about this political spectrum that rests on the back of a captive maternal, but how the players actually are not reified in any particular ethnic formation, meaning that it's just not capital as white capital, because there is considerable black wealth in the United States. It's concentrated in an elite at top, but it's still there, but also that Influential, authoritative women in their progressivism also have the capacity to silence captive maternals who come from anonymity and who come from poverty. So, I'm speed talking to you. Women's work is crystallizing the ungendered labor of the captive maternal, which is a non-gendered function, as I mentioned before, not a gendered identity inherently compatible with dominant feminisms. This tribute to Erica Garner, 1990 to 2017, examines nonverbal protest to the actions of the captive maternal or her children as surrogate activists, both inside the home and in public, and lastly, in political contests or struggles, which are linked to but remain independent from the private public sphere dichotomy. Because the terrain of political struggle is waged by the, waged by the captive maternal is not fixed territory and crosses all borders as it organically reinvents and remaps struggles against violence, police violence, bank violence through capital, educational violence through policing at school and just substandard education in general. The captive maternal thus is understood to be the caretaker of kin, community and self in a political economy which he would need to, and this, I really appreciate it, your, let's go to structure. It's almost like you would have to rethink the world if the ability to create news within the population were to cease. And it's that concentration of power to silence or to change by translation, interpretation, the very meaning of political speech is what I feel is not, I only can talk about what I see in the States, it is not strongly contested. Because what we have now is managerial politics, right? So that reform is the only option in struggle, but reform is funded by nonprofits. I'm definitely condensing all of this for you to read the time. <laughs> so the reform is condensed in palatable ways that can be consumed. We are a consumer society. You know, our economy is skewing increasingly towards billionaire class. We've gone past the millionaire to the billionaire class. The billionaire class has engineered our elections through their Supreme Court decision um, 2010 um, and Citizens United that unlimited money can go into elections. So you have billionaires such as the Koch brothers, the Mercers, who in fact had engineered the election of Donald Trump. But I want to argue that the very possibility of that form of experimentation on a democracy that was already flawed because it was born in slavery, in captivity, linked to the captive maternal. That ability to engineer and re-engineer is not so much just about the Russians and Cambridge Analytica and hacking. That is based on the way in which we envision a democracy that would be embraceable of blackness and the mute without the understanding that the embrace would be a factory of exploitation, right? And so in having a black president for eight years, 
it's not only that we went to sleep, we were encouraged to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. We were disciplined the way you put your children to bed at night at 8 o'clock, <laughs> that the lights go out, here's the music, and doze, right? Mm -hmm. And that was the official language, in fact, of the political left. Mm -hmm. sure. And that was the language of the black left. So now we're done. I can't read it. So, <laughs> We're in a quandary. I, I work with different sectors. I work with um, the mute, the mothers. I, I've been traveling a lot too much, but in um, Brazil and in Colombia, meeting with mothers, largely black mothers, including mothers in Chicago, whose children have been murdered or killed by police, paramilitary, or gangs. They have been silenced. They return to a voice. But the voice they find is channeled within official sectors. Mm -hmm because that is the language that is the meta-language for social change. Mm -hmm. And it is the language that is funded by the nonprofit sector, which is funded by the banks. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter in the US at this moment, even though there's the resistance that was rebelling against Trump, and the seating of Kavanaugh as the next Supreme Court justice, given the sexual assault charges against him. Which may win or may not win, and also Trump may be reelected in 2020 because there's a strong possibility he will. Mm -hmm. What we've lacked is the ability to articulate a desire for love and security in a language that we ourselves have engineered out of our own muteness. Yeah. That once they've cut out your tongue, like a starfish, you grow a new one right. in order to articulate what your needs are. But we've been told to doubt our capacity to regrow. Mm -hmm. We had our movements in the 1960s and 1970s I work with political prisoners at the second sector I work with. They were hunted, and we know this history. Um, some were murdered, like Fred Hampton. Some were killed in prison, like George Jackson. Who politicized Angela Davis into being an abolitionist? But then once she was politicized and he was killed, she had to forget her origins with Jackson. So she never mentions his name, right? So. Her need, and I worked with her, I've anthologized her, I get to say what I want. <laughs> her need to appeal to the prevailing culture and its need to have a docile political black shape the language of the discourse of abolitionism itself. So that when you find an Erica Gardner appear and she chooses a quote maverick candidate who you know, is an elderly white man, Jewish man from Brooklyn, who does not live the conditions, but is the only presidential candidate in the history of the United States who has explicitly denounced racism by taking on the police. Obama said he would not do it, he could not do it, he did not do it. There's been no liberal white Democrat who ever ventured into that language. So it seems to me that Erica Gardner's endorsement of Sanders would have brought the influential elite that defines abolitionism to the table for negotiation with her. That never happened. When I went to Brazil, when I went to Colombia, they knew who Erica Gardner was. They had no idea she died. She died in anonymity. She died from exhaustion. She gave birth to a baby boy. She lived to see the first six months. She named him Eric after her father. And the exhaustion of working on her father's behalf, the exhaustion of keeping herself and her young daughter intact emotionally, right? That exhaustion led to her suffocating in similar ways to her father. Without the Harvard being captured on film, I Can't Breathe became part of her asthma, part of her heart attack, part of her being in a coma, and part of her demise in December 2017. No one politically, in the, in the ranks of the political elite, has spoken out about this step in ways that are intelligible, that it is a rally, it is a call, it is a demand for a shout against forms of resistance that reproduce a captive maternal who will bleed out. Sure. Because there's no captive maternal for the captive maternal, mm -hmm. right? So that you will take care of the elders till they die, you will raise the children, whatever their mental or physical conditions are, you will keep community and church and religion together. And then if you dare, you will be politicized in ways that will make you a walking target. Mm -hmm. But you have no caretaker as backup. Mm -hmm. And so the disciplinary apparatus is an equal opportunity moment. And it is not so much 
it does not so much disparage our capacity to struggle, because that is limitless like our capacity to love, even though it mutates as the way we love does under captivity and constraint. It has been disciplined because I, this is my conjecture, I think we fear to love in ways in which we can't walk back. Does that make sense? Like, I've had mothers in Brazil, and I stop with this, Deborah De Silva, and then there some mothers in Chicago as well, we could talk about if you're interested. And I never met Barna, but I was struck by her, the beauty, the courage, and her efficacy that it, in ways it impressed me that the academics that I know and I run with, or used to run with, was never. But Deborah De Silva, when her son was murdered in Brazil, in the favelas, he was dismembered. Because part of the political messaging is, as we know, it's not enough to kill you. One has to mutilate the body, and one has to terrorize, because the political message is, do not imagine a state of struggle that has the possibility of freedom, the possibility of change in the nature of capital, the possibility of controlling police rather than being controlled by them. So she had to collect body parts or find body parts in order to constitute a burial. And that was an incomplete endeavor. The, my former doctoral students who introduced me to her, and now they have their dissertations, their academics, they along with NGOs brought her to the police because the police had to admit that this killing, like the Mario Franco assassination in Brazil in the spring, um, the city, the black lesbian city councilwoman who was assassinated in a <coughs> along with her driver for organizing against the paramilitary and against the favelas, and she was a mother as well, a captive maternal. They had to have a meeting and a negotiation with Deborah De Silva because the UN NGO apparatus had kicked in, and so there was media and there was negative press. When she sat down to, uh, to negotiate, they thought they could offer her a scholarship in her son's name, that they could build a community center or something in the favela, that they could offer her some cash buyout, and the Garner family got over $5 million. That's how it works in the US. We as black people pay taxes, and we pay for the police, and we pay for the police who kill her, usually exonerated, do it with impunity. And then when the city has to give a financial settlement, our taxes go to pay the disproportionately black families who have been victimized and criminalized by police violence. When she came to the table, and she looked at the menu that they presented her. She asked for one thing that was not on it. She said, I want my living son back. Mm -hmm. And the way I read that is, you act as if you're a god that you can take life, act like a god and resurrect it. Mm -hmm. And it was the inability to meet a demand that was not negotiable that broke down the talks. But this is a managerial level. The graduate students, the doctoral students, the NGO walked her out in the hallway, offered her water, offered her Tylenol, offered her mental health counseling, and then like, we've got so many minutes, we have to go back and meet with the state officials. She went, she took the water, refused the Tylenol and the counselor. She went back in, again at the table of power to negotiate. She said, resurrect my dead son. Mm -hmm. That was the intractable point, and that is the point of struggle in which everything changes. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to buy our grief right, to settle that woundedness through cash which we generate through our labor, captivity, and exploitation. So we're part of cycling capital back into our managerial modes, right? It's that moment, I think, where the captive maternal is in fact an embodiment of God herself, meets the sovereign as sovereign. And even though she leaves with nothing tangible, leaves with the capacity to take on power in all of its terror and to demand life. Thank you so much to the panel. Um, it's been so powerful. Um, I, think, I think we can go until two. Sure. Yeah. 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 I think it's yeah. 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 That must be yeah. taken, yeah. but we can go until two. Um, so I'll take the first round of comments and questions. See? Is someone there? Yes, PJ. So we'll start with this two. Oh my God, thank you. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for your work. 
Um, so I've been I've been wrestling with um, accepting the captive maternal <coughs> as no, I'm okay with accepting captive maternal as a function. I've been wrestling with not having the captive maternal as an identity. Um, and that's because I've, I've got hang-ups about things. And um, this, this, this last part that <coughs> Professor James was talking about reminds me of an instance that we had 2016 at this university when the cops were basically living in front of the Great Hall at the Piazza and we were doing a back and forth, like breaking pins, making stones, going back, getting shot, tear gas, hose, going back, mm -hmm. making more, coming back. And the ways in which um, we tangibly experienced the betrayal of allyship, of allies, um, who were trying to intimidate students into like, you get charged, don't do that, just stand back here, let's sing the song, come on, Amanja. And we were like, no. We kept going back. And then the academics came and said, we'll, we'll form a buffer for you and stand in front and we'll, we'll approach the cops together. The cops didn't care. They shot. They put out stamp grenades. And, um, and so I'm kind of concerned about the ways in which, and again, I think about um, Kimberly Crenshaw launching the Center for Intersectional Justice in Berlin, Germany last year, and how there were no black women in the room. Just like no black women. Everybody else was there though. The, the queer folks, the people of color, the... Everybody else was there. And the theory of intersectionality <coughs> came out of the experience and suffering of black women in particular. And so how can we think, like we were talking with Lynn yesterday, uh, tri-continentally or think um, across the histories of uh, colonialism or slavery or subjection and come up with a politics of us if we don't, if we don't, if we always constantly disappear. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm like, my mind is, is everywhere and I think the captive maternal as, as a concept and as a function is like doing incredible things to my own thinking, I'm scared it's going to be taken. Um, how do we, how do we, how do we keep it and 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 have the space to talk about a love that is violence and a love that is that's going to walk away, you know, when the when we get that the rules don't change. And of course, what happened at Vitz is once you know everybody came in like just negotiated management and blah, blah, and they came with a menu, mm -hmm. and we said no, we have one demand, no fee. Then the conversation collapsed and everybody walked away and we were left, you know, some of us are still in prison, traumatized, etc. Okay. Um, mine is more of a comment as well um, for Denis. Denis. Uh, this policing of, 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 of black bodies, particularly black female bodies, and it, it's a problem here in South Africa as well in our high schools, right? But it's also not the like the, the, the township schools, it's still like the former Model C schools, the private schools, high wall fences, security guard and all of that. And and I mean I used to be a teacher, but when you when you're in a space where you firstly you just interrupt in that space by being there as a black teacher who's not teaching an African language, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody just assumes you speak the language because you're there to speak the language and you become the face you become the face that this is the one you talk to if you want to talk about what black girls should wear this is the one you talk to if you want to talk about what black black girls hair should look like and it's so sad because it's that thing of we're not in those spaces to make those rules when they make those rules and when we arrive we arrive and these rules are thrown at us you you become the implementer you become the face you become the one who who wears all the backlash, right? And the biggest thing is, it's it's so real that when you encounter it as the person who's now living the rules and telling the rules, is that 
you also get indoctrinated into black girls will give you attitude black girls will do this black girls will do that and it's so hard that unless you leave that space and experience the world out there and hear other ways of thinking that you don't know any other way and it, it's sad it's sad for that teacher who stood there crying as well going but the rules say you know mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite a, a sad thing that it's still happening, especially in the private schools, in the Model C schools where, oh, but it's school tradition, but whose tradition is it? You know, who's, who's keeping it, who's making it thrive? So, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for that, because like I said, I used to be a teacher and I've witnessed being on the other side and you're just thrown with these things because you're the, you're the black face. Yeah. Um, hello everybody, thank you for your panel, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, really hard, <laughs> especially your last talk. Um, I, I don't have a question, it's a reflection. Um, and my reflection from hearing the last speaker um, is, is a feeling of uh, being emptied out um, and being extremely challenged. Um, having considered myself an activist for a long time um, and writing on queer life and death in South Africa. Um, so listening to you um, and the story of Erica Barner um, and of course, you know, influences from a lot of people in the U.S., including Angela Davis. But anyway, what the feeling of being emptied out is is having to think about my own politics um, or my yeah my own actions when, <coughs> on the one hand. Um, We've been fighting for, we've been fighting so that we can exist and not be murdered as black queer women and be dismembered and mutilated, etc. Uh, fighting against that, fighting the police, fighting our peers, fighting our families. Um, doing that in the university, doing that in society, etc. And yet, uh, wanting to find the response by advocating for something for a hate crimes bill mm -hmm. which would then incarcer incarcerate black people mm -hmm. because they killed me mm -hmm. um, and yeah <laughs> I mean I'm hearing what you're saying and Hard. What you're saying is really hard. It's, but thank you for saying it. It's just leaving me empty. And, and that emptiness is an emptiness that I've... I mean, I just quit my job at the University of Cape Town. And, and I felt I was empty, but I'm refueling. But now I'm having to think about 20 years of activism in the queer sector. And, <laughs> That's the reflection. But yeah. Thanks. And you didn't ask me to respond in. So everything that you struggle for exists. Like exists in memory, exists in the understanding of greater capacity exists in the fact that certain populations that were seen as disposable and that no one would fight to resist that disposability and murder, that that can't be taken for granted. I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, it's, to appear, which is exhausting, I agree with you, to continuously show up, it's like, the, it's like a 36-hour job in a 24-hour day. 
but you still did it, and the memory of that, and the gift of that, and the grace of that endures. And I'm not speaking in like an abstract, whatever way. I mean, it's tangible, it's real. It's, it's when I talk to people who are in the Black Panther Party, and they were like, oh my God, what were we thinking? We never should have. And they're not just talking about the militarism. They were talking about the very idea that they could take on an imperial democracy, mm -hmm. born in white supremacy, enslavement and genocide, and alter its trajectory. But they did it, and what people are not looking at as closely, and we talked about this, is the fact the state thought they could take them on as well. And that's why they began the assassinations. Like, why would you need to assassinate Martin Luther King? You only have to when he moved from civil rights to a critique of imperial, imperial wars in Vietnam and the so-called Third World, and when he started to condemn capitalism. Then the trajectory had the possibility of going off grid. And I'll give you one example and I will stop. I think, I think as, as people who are not masculinized or in the conventional way or not perceived to have power, that we apologize a lot. And we, first we're supposed to apologize for our parents in spaces where like, it's a gated community, so they let you in for like a day pass or something, right? But don't even assume that your intellectual, your virtue, you know, has the kind of merit or worth. And then we apologize to our families, we apologize to our communities, we apologize to our children because we can't save everybody. And because we offend whoever, whenever, at whatever time. But the beauty of, of manifesting it all is that we constitute a wild card. And that's what I saw Erica Garner as. It's the unexpected that appears in the moment that will be remembered, despite who paves it over. And so the thing I wanted to point out about abolitionism and the war on drugs, people are treating the abolitionist movement as a movement against mass incarceration, tracing its origins, important texts like Michelle Alexander and Eugene Crow, Angela's work, Crit Resist, all that important work. But this, the question of origins is central. Nixon conceptualized the war on drugs in the 1960s to destroy the political movements. His position was straight up racist, which is a consistent theme for American presidents. His position was, right, we blame the blacks, and it wasn't poor blacks, or it was just general, just blame the blacks, because that's going to work. Donald Trump knows the same thing, right? And we blame white radical students who are against the war and against capital. But we can't just blame them because it looks like we're unethical or authoritarian. So we say the blacks are addicted to heroin, so they're junkies. And we say the student radicals are addicted to pot or marijuana. And then we sell a war on drugs to the nation to maintain stability of the democracy. Right? All of these wars are political wars. Our pushback is not politicized like that because, one, we've been trained not to articulate politics in that fashion, but two, the question becomes, do we really want to be political warriors? Knowing the cost that we already pay, as you said rightly, to just stay alive. But I think it's like you're staying alive, keeping communities alive, is what opens the door and the windows to that kind of political struggle and the very imagination that would allow it to take place. Yeah, um, <coughs> I want to respond to you. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to bring in something that you said, although you weren't speaking to me, you were speaking to Professor James. Um, and um, so I want to talk about the black woman, mm -hmm. that she did love those girls. Mm -hmm. In fact, that I stayed, they wanted to write a story, they wanted her to be the hero, the mm -hmm. hero, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't know that she couldn't advocate for me. Whatever sure. they thought about me, they didn't know that. So mm -hmm. it was also a shock. So let me just say one thing, it's a little bit divergent, but going back to something you said, not just about the captive maternal, but about going to a space um, where King Crenshaw was speaking, you know, black people. I don't find this surprising because we keep talking about people of color. That town hall that I had, I changed all that literature. Our town hall was not about girls of color. Mm -hmm. 
If you're a girl of color and you couldn't identify as black, I have no use for you mm -hmm. in that town hall. Mm -hmm. So that language, again, is a branding language. Mm -hmm. It's the language that sells, mm -hmm. because blackness doesn't sell. Yeah. You've got to remove it. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want to say about that woman, about the Captain Maternal, and I don't know that Joy agrees here, but I think that the way that you worry about the identity piece is that you end up giving so much content to the function that you could not be talking about anyone but black people. And Joy did this in a talk. We were in a talk where jo jo Jane uh, Yancey was speaking. And he was speaking in this way. Again, I'm not saying he did this on purpose, but it invites white people to think you're talking about their oppression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this woman immediately was like, yes. She actually stated it like that. Yes, I am oppressed like you. And, and then Yancey got upset. No, I'm not talking about you. And, he, and then she started claiming her oppression. And Joy looked at her and said, because we had just been reading, I had just sent Joy an article, a, another black man just shot in the back, in his own backyard. Mm -hmm. And here was the grandmother crying and saying, did you have to kill him? Couldn't you just maim him? Mm -hmm. So Joy asked that white woman, oh, are those your possibilities? Mm -hmm. Are those your possibilities that you have to say, can't you just maim my child? Mm -hmm. So I think that if you look at this structurally, and this is where I don't know if we uh, might not agree here, but when I think of the black woman, mm -hmm. to keep her job and take care of her own little black girls, mm -hmm. she's within that system. Mm -hmm. When I think about blackness, it's in that space that you can define this function where a black maternal, and I think of the work of Octavia Butler, yeah. mm -hmm. sadly enough, we have to, in fact, kill community to love community. We have to kill our own to love our futures. What, what other forms of oppression look like that? We have to actually, it, we, we, we are constituted, our oppression has been constituted in a way such that we don't survive without killing the people we love. Yeah. I really think it, the, the, the answer comes not from necessarily going to identity, but giving a firmer and firmer um, characterization of that function and grounding it in that fact mm -hmm. that we've got to kill our own in order to live, in order to love. And that's how radical the love has. Sorry. Perfect. Thank you. 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 Thank